Hi, everyone. Welcome today. My name is Jason Flat, and I'm excited today to welcome you to Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast. Welcome to Compassionate Las Vegas. I'm your host, Will Rucker, and I am thrilled that you are joining us again for season three. Can you believe we are in season three of the podcast? Where does the time go? Well, our city, since we last spoke, has actually adopted compassion as our value. So I think the podcast might be on to something and Las Vegas just might actually be compassionate Las Vegas. With that, I would like to welcome today's guest, none other than the amazing, the inspirational, the brilliant Dr. Jason Flatt. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here with you today, Will. Yeah, it's so, so great to have you on. We've spent way too many hours on Zoom. I can't wait till we do this face to face, but I'm just always so uh, just moved by your compassion and the way that you care for others and the work that you are doing. So for those that may not have seen us on a webinar or heard of your work, could you just share what it is that you are doing and also why you're doing it? Sure. So I do research with the community and I've really uh, adopted approach uh, it, using some educational language. We call it community-based participatory research. And so what that really means is that the community is at the center of the work that we're doing. It's not that they're a second thought, right? It's not that we just come in, we get the information we need and we leave. It's about answering meaningful questions that the community wants to know about. So that's at the core of the research that I do. And then I'm focused specifically on LGBTQIA+. So that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, uh, queer, intersex, as well as people that may identify as asexual or additional identities. And so I'm really concerned about aging and also people having the necessities that they need so that they can stay in our community, age in the way that they want, but also live a meaningful and purposeful life. So my work has been focused specifically on looking at concerns around dementia. It's a major concern for people as they get older and something really unique for our community because many do not have some of the care support that they need. And they also don't have resources that have been developed that are as welcoming for our community. So that's a big piece. And then the other part that I'm focused on is affordable and welcoming housing. So I'm really interested in ways that here in Las Vegas, we can create affordable housing that welcomes our LGBTQIA plus advocates, our trailblazers that have made so much progress in the rights that we get to enjoy today. And we need to be honoring them and ensuring that they're safe and they're welcomed and that they can call Las Vegas home for as long as they want. And so that's really the goal of the research that we're doing. Just applause to all of that. I mean, wow. CBPR, Community-Based Participatory Research, is Mm -hmm. totally one of my favorite things. I've always felt that we should include those that we impact. And I've been very, very blessed. I come from a very privileged background. And so, you know, I've never had some of the struggles that others have faced. I've been very fortunate to have good health and my family has been blessed with good health. So a lot of the things that others have been personally impacted by, I have not. And so how dare I make decisions on their behalf? How dare I tell others what they should be doing? And I've never even had to step a day in their shoes, let alone a lifetime. The other thing that you mentioned around the housing piece, that is so important. I was, again, privileged to know my great-grandmother. She practically raised me 
both of my parents worked. And so she would come over to the house and babysit. I would spend time with her at her apartment in the summer. So really close relationship, like a six-year-old and a six-year-old together is really <laughs> like to see. Yeah. Uh, what I learned from her was that it gets difficult when you're aging. And my great grandfather did pass before I was born. So she had been alone for quite some time and navigating life as an older individual that mentally she didn't know she was older. Like she still felt fully vibrant. But when she went to stores and, you know, experienced life and applied for housing, all of those things factored in. Uh, mm -hmm. so thank you for, first of all, I just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing and the research you're conducting and bringing that to our city right here in Las Vegas. My question in all of this is really, what do we need to be doing as a city, as a community to mm -hmm. truly be compassionate? Yeah, well, I think it's, we look at models, right? There's many cities that have really focused on becoming age-friendly. Right. So that's making sure we have the transportation services that our community needs. That's making sure we have services right through the city. So we do have right senior centers throughout the city, but are they accessible? Uh, do we have other places that are accessible? So uh, healthcare resources, other opportunities to keep our community engaged. They should be invited to all of our events, right? Any of our social and community events. They should make sure that they're age friendly, they're welcoming, uh, and that they embrace older people, right? It's it's they've had such a role in defining our city, contributing to its history, to its progress, and where we're at today. And so we need to make sure that they are embraced and know that they're a huge part of why we're here today, why we're doing the work that we're doing, and we need to honor them. And, and I think that's a big piece that Vegas can do for our older generation. When you say age-friendly, mm -hmm. what does that actually look like in practice? So if, if I'm hosting an event or the podcast, for example, what would make this age-friendly? Yeah. So, I mean, for this piece, it might be adding, uh, right, different forms of audio or subtitles, right, for people that may have hearing impairment or vision impairment, making sure there's different ways they connect with the tools. It also could be going out into the community when you're hosting an event in the community, make sure it's wheelchair accessible, make sure that it's accessible to people that might have mobility limitations. Think about transportation, right? If people are going to access trans public transportation or even um, some of the regional transport uh, aspects to help people get around, make sure that it's accessible. Um, make sure that other pieces in the environment, right? Do you have an accessible restroom that people can use? Do you have potentially access to refreshments and, and any other needs that the community might need? Uh, if you're doing a public event, make sure to think about how do we accommodate people that are going to have mobility limitations, right? Think about the seating. Think about the space between uh, the walkways and uh, paths. Think about that. Uh, maybe you need to hire someone uh, that is, uh, you know, does sign language so that people that are hearing impaired can still participate and be a part of it. I think it's small steps that we can take that can accommodate people and just make sure that they feel welcomed and know that we're thinking of them and we want them to be there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take that and make it a checklist because <laughs> so many great ideas. And what I heard you say is really just be considerate, be aware that others may not have the same ability that you have and mm -hmm. they may need different accommodation. That really be compassionate. Right? Be compassionate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the spirit of inclusion. That's the spirit mm -hmm. when we're talking about diversity and equity and inclusion. That's really the spirit is getting outside of our own headspace and being aware of others. 
Now, I think that there are some steps we have to take in order to accommodate even that step forward. I, mm-hmm. I look at Maslow's hierarchy, right? You've got the, mm-hmm. the basic physiological needs as the foundation. In our community, we have far too many individuals who are unhoused. We have far mm-hmm. too many individuals who are hungry. We have far too many individuals who are struggling to get a quality education. The list goes on. What can we do to ensure that these are these issues are being addressed in a way that is inclusive of our greater community? I think one of the strategies could be bringing different groups together. Something that I've noticed just in my short time in Las Vegas, I've been here a little over two years, and something that I've noticed is that organizations aren't talking to one another. A lot of groups aren't working together. And I think one of the roles that we can do is to bring different groups together. Let's bring the LGBT Center to the table. Let's bring uh, Nevada Aging Services to the table. Let's bring city members to the table, any of the service groups. Let's bring leaders from casinos or groups that lead our parks or our public transportation. Let's bring all of them to the table and have them talk about ways that they're meeting the needs of our community, but also present some of the gaps. And I've seen an amazing model here. It could be as easy as just hosting a dinner that brings people together, right? Just gets them talking, gets them knowing each other, because that's where we start building this collaboration and we can make change in the city that will meet the needs of everybody. And I think that that's a huge piece that we could focus on. Jason, I am such a fan. (laughs) Everything you just said, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Bringing people together is is my heart. That's that's the thing that I've, I've worked towards literally my entire life. What I have found is when we get people together, that's when magic can occur because you start to realize, oh my gosh, I thought we were so different, but guess what? On these 99 out of 100 things, We are so similar. Mm -hmm. We at the core want the same thing here. We might see how to get there a little differently, but the experience you just told me, the the story you shared, it changed my perspective. It helped me to see it from a different way. And Mm -hmm. I love that you include dinner. Uh, Food is kind of one of my favorite things. So, you know, what's what's better than having conversation over dinner? Well, and it brings people together. That's the common, right? We need something to to kind of have a, a... like it's, we call it like breaking bread, right? Or something that like brings us together that kind of creates community and we can have a, a common language and a common like experience, right? Shared experiences together. And I think that that is something that's missing right now, especially with what's happened with the, the pandemic, right? We all were talking today virtually, but we need to get people in the same room safely but in a way that can generate ideas and we can kind of, I think of it as like cross pollinating, right? Sharing like what works for you, what's working for you, what isn't, how can I help? How can we leverage each other's resources? How can we share, uh, right? I have this connection with this organization. They could help you address this issue for the community. Uh, And then the next group can share, yeah, I have this, or I even recently got a a new program up and running. I learned this past week, for instance, that the center is now going to be partnering with uh, Three Square, our local food bank. And on Wednesdays, they're actually going to have Three Square there And they're going to be able to connect people to services. They have transportation vouchers. They have resources. If you do are experiencing food insecurity, how can we make sure you can get meals? How can we make sure you have access to transportation? Maybe you're eligible for subsidized health care. How can we sign you up? Maybe you need subsidies for your housing. How can we make sure, you know, if you're eligible, how can we get you the help that you need? And so it's bringing groups together, literally hosting another organization at your physical space to meet with your participants, your clients, and just imagine the reach and the partnership that can come from that. Yeah, that's, that's again, incredible. And I, I like the approach because in my experience, if you bring people together for 
a policy conversation. They kind of show up with their policy in mind, and now they have to advocate for their position. They have to prove their mm -hmm. their way is the right way. Whereas if it's more of a community setting where it really is about collaboration, about having a conversation, about saying, hey, we've got these six issues going on in the ideas versus come with your idea. Mm -hmm. and, you just have a more authentic conversation and that ego kind of gets displaced a bit. And when I say ego, I mean kind of some of that pridefulness, mm -hmm. uh, that public facing persona, you know, how that can be. So, yeah, I, I think you're, you're spot on. What are some of the gaps that you're experiencing? What, what challenges have you uh, been facing with particularly the housing for LGBTQIA plus seniors? Yeah, so I think the hard part right now is just learning about what people need, right? Learning from the community. We're hearing a lot of viewpoints from service providers, organizations that are meeting the needs of some of our community members, but I don't think we have a clear understanding of today, what are the current challenges? What's happening with the pandemic, right? What's happening with, we're seeing across the city, a major increase in people's rents, right? We've seen the expiration of the eviction uh, moratorium. So there's a potential that people are at risk of losing housing if they're behind on their, their payments. Um, so we don't know enough. And so I think that we need to have some community listening sessions, literally sit in the community and talk to people, learn what's going on, what are the challenges they're having, what are, what's going well, though. Let's not just focus on, you know, the problems. We also need to know what's working. So can we take what's working and make it even better, right? That's maybe the strategy versus always focusing on the deficits. And that's really hard to always address, right? Because we don't have part of the reason for these deficits is a lack of resources. And so we need to find out what resources do we need? What groups can we bring together, right? To help meet those resources. And I think of it more as like, it's sharing versus competing, right? We're not competing. We're coming together to help our community. And that should be the goal. And we need to make sure, though, that our community is there or else we're not really helping. If we come up with ideas of how to help, that's probably not going to work, right? It's like coming from our own perception. So we really need to have an idea of really what's happening and who's being affected. Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling and kind of giggling to myself because it's like you're the compassionate researcher. You know, let me get more information. Let's find <laughs> out more, you know, but, but let's make sure the community is there because I'm humble enough to know I would get it wrong. Like, it's, it's just amazing to me. Yeah, uh, know your privilege, right? It's like, yeah. I have no, I am not experiencing housing insecurity. So <laughs> I don't know what that's like, right? Um, and, and so we need to learn. I try to employ a technique called appreciative inquiry. And it's exactly what you're talking about. It's identifying the things that are working and really trying to amplify those pieces. You acknowledge that there are shortcomings. I mean, that's why you're at the table, mm -hmm. but you also, you focus your energy on the good. And I always say, let's craft our policy based on the world we want, not as band-aids to the world that we have. Exactly. And so that's kind of what I heard from you in that. You could call it like a strengths-based approach, right? That's another way of framing it. Let's focus on like our strengths and not our weaknesses, not our deficits, like you said. Yeah, I think that's um, one I think there will be more success from an approach like that. I think people are also more open to hearing about it. We all want to hear about the good, right? We all want to hear about what's working. And it's really discouraging when we focus just on all the problems. It feels like you're almost digging a hole that you could never get out of. Um, so I think if you focus on the strengths, if you're able to kind of highlight one, your successes, but also what is working well for the community and leverage those and kind of learn from it, then you might be able to actually make a sustainable change that really makes an impact on people's lives. 
Yeah, let me ask you this because mm-hmm. I, I want to challenge you just a little bit about yeah. people wanting to hear the good. And mm-hmm. here's why. When whenever I post, you know, uh, here's a wonderful thing that happened this week, it's like three or four clicks, you know, and, and <laughs> maybe one comment. But if I'm like, oh my gosh, my tire blew out, the dog kicked me in, and the you know, tornado came through, we don't even have tornadoes, it's like a hundred shares and ten thousand people comment. It seems that people are drawn to the negativity. Why does it appear that way? Huh. I think. Well, we're talking today about compassion, right? And what you're hearing is people have compassion. We don't want others to suffer, right? And we really care about other people. That's why I've got we to, are I've got to as a society. Oh my gosh, that was such an aha for me because I've looked at it and you're proving this strengths-based appreciative inquiry approach is like the thing because I've looked at it as people like to see what's wrong and what's happening. But really, if you dig a little deeper, if you go beyond the surface, what's really happening is we all have a innate disposition to be compassionate. We all have this desire to help and to alleviate suffering of others, which is kind of how I define compassion. Mm -hmm. So that's brilliant. How would you describe compassion? How would you define that? I think of it, I mean, when I think of the word compassion, I'm like, pull from the first letter with like a C it's like care, like caring. Um, It's trust. It's openness. It's listening. um, Letting the other person, you know, or others have their experience. Um, Compassion, I think is more than just jumping in and trying to solve the issue. It's waiting and listening and learning and supporting and coming up with solutions or even helping the community to come up with the solutions, right? It's not about uh, judgment or uh, competing or even egos, right? It should be about helping and caring for other people. That's how I interpret it. Um, there's kindness in there as well. Uh, and I think that just us as beings, it's a part of who we are. We are formed in social groups, right? We've heard about things like, uh, emotional intelligence and all of these different pieces that come in line. And I think we all innately have that in us and it's just tapping into it and listening and, and giving back. And yeah, those are. Yeah. And you, you had this, this what I call a systems lens around that because a lot of times, particularly with the issue of unhoused humans, Mm. people want to do something. And so maybe it's giving them food. So I'll, you know, I'll start cooking every day and, and feed 50 people, which I admire. I think that that's such a great idea Mm-hmm. And then you also fill the emergency rooms because the food wasn't cooked right or it was out too long. And where do they, you know, or it's not cash? healthy, right? It's not like healthy. Yeah. someone has diabetes maybe. And so you're not giving them right. We're thinking about meals and a lot of the food that we serve is processed. So it's mm-hmm. like, or it's focused on calories, but not on the quality of the calories, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, I agree. It's like, yes, we got to fill people's tummies, but we also have got to fill their hearts, their minds, their spirit, right? They're a whole person. And so it's important that we think about some of these other aspects when we're meeting their needs. Yeah, I, I also kind of giggle to myself a little bit when I go to a public health meeting and look at the snack table. Because I'm like, wait a minute. What, what's there? So, because it's just not healthy. It's it's the exact wrong thing. Unfortunately, <laughs> public health is not a very lucrative field. So, those processed foods are pretty cheap, um, right? Uh, a lot of those like sweets and things are usually cheap, and and we know that usually people won't take that apple. Um, but we can keep trying. Yeah. And and again, that's a systems thing. When you look at the very structure of our society, it's so affordable to eat 
processed foods, things are not healthy, which mm -hmm. then reinforces that cycle of people that are impoverished having poor health outcomes. And it just keeps going and keeps going. How would you look at kind of untangling this web? So people that in a sense are complicit in upholding the existing structures that, I mean, candidly, we do benefit from, how do we kind of un unwind and untie ourselves from that to enact true systemic change? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the piece really to make a change is, in my mind, is to advocate for policy change, um, to get a role in, right, making a larger change that could be sustained and impact more people, right? And so that's a big piece when we're competing against the current structures and we might as well just say it, it's like, it's all based on money. Um, and basically people trying to hold on to that money or hold on to power that they won't relinquish. And I, I try to not like, I don't think that we can compete against that necessarily. Um, I think that we bring people to the table that are committed, have compassion, do not want the same structures in place as they are currently today. Um, and then we go and talk to our lawmakers. We call them, we visit them, we bring people together. Um, we keep advocating, we keep educating, and we keep supporting those groups that are working towards dismantling the way that it currently is. Um, we have to change the way that society is structured, the way that current systems work, or else we're not going to continue to, one, uh, continue to grow, but also be impactful and welcoming to our entire community that lives here. Um, and I think that that really is the way to do it. And I think that um, the reminder, I always take it, I love Michelle Obama. So when they go low, we go high. And I mean, but that means like beyond it's like practicing what you preach. It's not um, participating or supporting systems, right? That continue to perpetuate discrimination, perpetuate poverty and take away from the community. Uh, so you just, those are the ways that I think we can do it, um, but I don't have all the solutions for sure. And I think that there's a, a lot of people that have great ideas and it's just bringing them together and trying to make change and not giving up. Yeah. You remind me uh, again, I, I love that. I actually have that quote on my vision board and I, I hear a lot of people in the political space saying, oh, you just didn't like whatever individual because they had mean tweets. And it's like, no, that's not really the issue. It's the fact that in that role of influence, when you have mean tweets, what you are unleashing is a culture of anti-kindness, not just being unkind, mm -hmm. but like anti-kindness. I also see, well, let me back up just a hair. When I moved to Nevada seven years ago, I was amazed at how accessible politicians were here, state senators and assembly persons and county commissioners, the list goes on. And I got to know a lot of these people very intimately. My, my first week in town, like my best friend took me to a senator's house for a party. And I'm like, this is a senator's party? What, you know, this is kind of cool. So the other side of that is a lot of them are extremely compassionate and they also really enjoy having their seat because they hope they can make a change, mm -hmm. but to actually say what they're really thinking would cost them votes, which would cost them their seat. And it's this kind of paradox and, and I don't know quite the right word, but there's an issue where it seems as though compassionate leadership isn't welcomed by the voting populace. It, it, how do you see that? Yeah, that's a really good point, Will. I, I think we need to learn more from our politicians about why they make these decisions. And maybe we need to have a greater understanding of what they're having to balance. 
um, when they're making some of the decisions that we think, you know, aren't compassionate, they aren't thinking about the broader community's needs, or they censor themselves because they're worried about what the polls are going to say. I, you know, I, it's something I don't know enough about the daily lives of our political members. I'm grateful for their service. I think many of them, as you mentioned, are in it for to help people. They're truly Samaritans, good Samaritans that want to help our communities. And I know they're committed to that. And yet they have to balance many of the competing priorities in our city. It could be between funding additional education versus meeting the needs of people that are currently homeless. And I think of like, how do I weigh that? How do I make a decision who, which program gets more money? And what happens if neither program has enough for it to be successful? How do I make those decisions? And I, I honestly, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think it's, I definitely think we need more of it, more compassion, more work happening. But um, I think it's just going to take time. Yeah, I, I think that what you just said is exactly it. Helping just everyday citizens understand, like, first of all, your elected official is human. That's mm -hmm. number one. They're, they're human just like you. And they're making, oftentimes, making choices between just terrible and horrible, like, neither outcome is desirable and you have to pick like the least worse or or what you feel could potentially have the the better impact and that to me is leadership in general when when you're leading a classroom as a teacher it's what do i do i've got to hit these standards and i also have to provide the emotional support i've also got to do this mm -hmm. what comes first uh, my mom uses the example of a water balloon she's like your water balloon is leaking in 100 places which hole do you plug? Mm -hmm. Of course, my answer is always, well, we shouldn't have a leaky water balloon if we had fixed <laughs> the system, but that's a whole nother podcast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, Jason, this time has gone by so quickly. I just appreciate you sharing your perspective and your heart with us today. Yeah. If there was a song that would explain or a, a line from a song that would kind of demonstrate your vision for Las Vegas, what might that be? Hmm. I have to think about this. What is one that uh, really sticks with, I don't even know the word. I recently heard a song that was singing about Vegas. Uh, <laughs> and Viva it me... Las Vegas. That yeah. Was... Okay. <laughs> no, it was like another more of a like a pop or R&B type song, but I don't remember the, the name of it, um, but it had a great jingle. Um, well, what song do you listen to when you need to feel inspired or to, to have yeah, hope? What song do I listen to when trying to think i mean mostly i just listen to high energy happy music uh right it, um just something that uh brings me joy and happiness and uh i listen to a lot of pop today what was i i was on a um, journal club today and we were listening to oh i'm coming out by diana ross oh that's uh, i great. really love that one um so we had a a group and I had some music in the background while people were waiting to join. Um, so yeah, uh, I love music. Something that makes me happy and wants to dance is definitely uh, something that I would want to uh, bring and, and share with others. Yeah, I think that's the energy of our city. It really is. We have just a, a joy that is built in to Vegas. And that's why, of course, so many people come visit, not just because we've got great resorts and great mountain ranges and everything, but because our spirit is joy here. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that that's how you highlight it. My, my last question is, is really very simple. And it is, if you could wave a magic wand and change anything in our city, what would that be and why? I would come up with the solution for homelessness to address our, our homelessness epidemic right now. 
Um, I don't actually know what that solution is, but if I've got the wand, hopefully it would come up with the right one. I think it's multi-pronged. It's a pretty complex. We need all the organizations coming together, right, to help our people that currently are unhoused, as well as to make sure that those that are maybe at risk of losing their housing don't, right? And so addressing homelessness would be probably, if I could cure that, I mean, I would love to be able to just cure it for everywhere, uh, but that would be probably the issue that's closest to my heart when I see people here that uh, maybe are challenged or are suffering a bit. It, it always makes me want to do something to make it easier for them and better. Um, and, and I think that if we do this though, we don't take away their rights. We're not institutionalizing people. What we're doing is giving them the support that they need and just make sure that they're able to take it. Yeah, that's beautiful. This season has been so different from our past seasons, just a different energy around it. Some of the things that you shared about collaboration and what's happening at the center, that just was not on our radar when this podcast began. So I'm, I'm so inspired and I hope that you are listening and viewing audience are inspired and filled with hope as a result of today's conversation with none other than the amazing, the brilliant, the compassionate Dr. Jason Flatt. Thank you for watching. We will see you again with our next guest who is also going to inspire you. So tune in next week. We'll see you back here on Compassionate Las Vegas, the podcast.